Hey guys, um, so I have been saving up for a really long time to get this power hammer to do some furniture and some really cool stuff. One thing that I've noticed is lacking on the internet is a lot of power hammer tooling, how to make it, how to use it, what you need, what you don't need. I have none of, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, just so happened Haley Woodward is um, traveling through town with all of the stuff that I have questions about spending a day in the shop showing me how to make the tooling and how to use it. Hi everybody, I'm Haley Woodward uh, visiting from Austin, Texas uh, where I uh, kind of work and have a studio and I also teach there at uh, Austin Community College where we have a program uh, where we learn how to use all this type of stuff, a, a, a degree program in architectural and ornamental metals uh, aka blacksmithing um, and so yeah, I'm on, I'm on the road and I'm, I happen to have this stuff with me from some other workshops I'm gonna go teach this summer. And uh, yeah, so I'm here to kind of kind of give a little overview of some of my tooling. And um, I guess I would say right off the bat that this is not the only way to do all this stuff. There's a lot of ways out there and there's a lot of kind of variations of things that look a lot like this. This is just kind of what works for me, especially in a setting, uh, teaching, teaching this kind of curriculum in a school setting. Um, but I think you'll find that you can kind of jump off of that pretty well and, and, and uh, create some interesting things with this, with this setup here. Um, and I think the first thing I would talk, show you guys is kind of um, under the power hammer would be these hand tools. Um, there's a lot of other stuff on the table here, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and so got a variety of tools on the table here, and the way they work is they're basically uh, they're a top tool, so it's a lot like um, holding a tool, uh, like a handled tool that you might use at the anvil uh, with a striker, for example. Um, so, but instead of the, uh, a partner striking a tool with a sledgehammer, the power hammer is going to strike the tooling for me. So I'm going to hold the, the work in my hand and set a tool on top of it. Um, and then basically, you can make a lot of different shapes to, to function in that, in that way. So, for example, I think the most common ones that I... Uh, or use the most would be a butcher or a side set and a flatter. Um, I use them all the time in the work that I make. Um, and uh, they're pretty relatively easy to make. Um, I end up making them out of uh, a two inch round bar. Um, so this is just mild steel. Um, and you can see that I've tacked on this little uh, piece of angle iron here so that it basically the, the clamp in my saw can hold on to that and I can cut that guy right down the middle and divide it into, in half. And then I end up with a piece that looks like this, and that becomes my flatter. You can see how I would drill a hole into this, uh, the appropriate size for my handle material, which in this case is 3 8 um, Had to sand that down just a little bit so it would fit in there nice and snug. Get that on there. Um, that fits like that. Usually I try and kick that all to one side so they hang on the wall nice and neat. Um, and then I'm basically just gonna, with our little handy MIG welder, just run a bead around that so it sits on there nice and tight. Why do you, why do you actually drill a hole in the inset? Yeah, so you could just butt the handle material up and weld it, but I guess I like the kind of fail safe of that mechanical connection inside the material. So if the weld happens to crack, be, uh, there's still a little something holding onto it inside the material uh, or inside the flatter. Kind of prevents like a shear. Yeah, it just I just feel like it yeah, prevents it from just completely flying off the handle uh, if something goes wrong. Um, and uh, yeah, again, all this is mild steel. You can definitely make these out of tool steel and I'm sure a lot of people will say that that's probably a better way to do it. I think that mild steel works really well. I've had these tools for a long time and they're holding up fine. Um, and in a school setting, I like to run mild steel tooling under the hammers just in case somebody is having a bad day and makes a, a, a bad, poor judgment. Um, there's not hardened tool steel under the dies and under the hammers. I think it just feels a little safer to me. But in your own shop, you know, do whatever you gotta do. You could use, you know, another material besides mild steel, 4140, something like that. I just use mild steel and I just quench it. I think it gets a little bit stiffer and a little less likely to dent, um, but it still is a very safe tool to use in a school setting. So I'm gonna quench this uh, flatter in the water. And one thing I'm gonna keep in mind is I'm gonna keep the, um, the weld on the handle as it attaches to the actual flatter. 
Uh, I'm gonna keep that out of the water. I don't wanna quench the weld and make the weld brittle. I just wanna take the body of the flatter and get it to harden up a little bit or shrink up a little bit and be a little bit more, a little bit tougher. Okay, so that's all ready to roll now. I'm just gonna let that cool down um, and then it's uh, ready to use. Oh, and I guess I, maybe did I mention, um, I also, you know, sanded it flat. I rounded out the edges a little bit. So it's got a, you know, it's not a, it's not a sharp edge, but it's a, a rounded edge right there. So it doesn't leave marks in the work as, as much. Um, so yeah, flatter, ready to go. Jumping back to this, the side set is once I've created a, a, a you know, the other half of the flatter, I end up cutting that in half again. So I take this guy like this, weld it on there again, and I cut that in half, and that gives me my uh, handheld butcher like that. And that's uh, great to use for side setting and material and creating shoulders uh, from, one, from one side. I have other tools here as well. Um, you know, things like this is just round bar, uh, and I use it for setting um, like basically a fuller. Um, smaller flatters are helpful as well as bigger flatters um, are helpful, um, you know, just for tight areas or for uh, more detailed work. Um, I think it's very adorable as well. Um, it's just nice to have that around. Um, you know, these are kind of ball fullers on a handle. Um, these are just, again, mild steel balls that I ordered off the internet. Um, things like, uh, you know, multifunction tools. This could be anything from a kiss block on a handle or a kiss stick to uh, a way to kind of, you know, if I need to make a very small isolation in the material, uh, and I can't fit that on the die, I'd use this tiny little kind of cross section to get in there and manipulate the material. So there's really no, I mean, you can kind of make all kinds of different tooling that you want. Um, the trick is, I think, to have it on, uh, you know, a long enough handle to where your hand is not near the dies. Um, and I make all these handles out of mild steel so that they have a little bit of flex to them. So that if you're slightly off in how, you're, how level the tooling is, you're not absorbing all that shock right into your hand. Because no matter what, if you're not level, the hammer yeah, is gonna is hammer's it's gonna level like it. This and the dies come down like, like yeah, this. bang! Then that yeah. all that force is gonna get snapped up into your hand over and over again. So I like a, a kind of a flexible, mild steel handle if I can. Um, it also helps to just learn to keep things really level. <laughs> um, but you know we all have kind of misfires and stuff. Um, but I think now maybe I'll show a little bit about using the butcher and the flatter um, with some material. Absolutely. Cool. We just made a flatter, so now I'm going to just kind of show you how I use a flatter uh, under the power hammer. Uh, I'm going to just taper a piece of square bar and then use the flatter to clean that up a little bit. So here we go. Got some one inch square. So I've tapered the bar, tumbling it, uh, alternating 90 degrees between each hit to rough out the taper. Uh, then I draw the taper to kind of smooth it out, but I'm still left with these uh, kind of steps in the material from the uh, top die and the bottom die uh, meeting at the same time on the material. So what the flatter does is basically uh, allows me to tilt the top die something I can do easily at the anvil with my hand hammer, but I can't do at the power hammer because the top die is fixed. So this becomes an intermediary between the top die and the work. So I can set the material on the... That takes out some of the harsh lines in the material. Uh, I can keep kind of going over that to, to uh, smooth it out even more. But that's one use that will, or one use of the flatter is basically to interrupt the top die 
and give us an angled top die to, uh, to smooth out the work. So next would be um, using the side set or the butcher, uh, which again, it's just a quarter cut out of the round bar. Uh, and I'm gonna use that to basically dig in from the top and create a shoulder in the material. And then I'll also use the flatter again at the end of the heat to help clean up that shape as well. Pretty nice as is, but maybe I want to draw that down. Um, so I'm going to do that. So because the top die and the bottom die meet, at the same, uh, on the same line, I'm always digging in a little bit right there, but the flatter can come back in and help me make that transition a little bit smoother. I can use it to basically offset the top die. Or I can flip this over and I can use it this way to get the same result. The piece is getting a little cold, so it's not reacting quite as well as it should, but you can see how this, again, the top die and the bottom die are fixed. I can't really move them around, but the flatter can allow me to get a side, uh, uh, half-faced hammer blow on the edge of the bottom die um, like this. So another really useful way that we use the flatter um, on the flat die configuration. Then the round fuller. So very similar to what the side set did here, but it's round, so it gives you that different shape. What does it do? I don't know, but there it is. I like that thing. <laughs> okay, so next up, we've got a, another tool that you use. Um, in this case, it's gonna go on the bottom. Uh, so again, the dies line up, uh, but sometimes you want a smaller bottom die so that you can set shoulders. Um, and so that's what this tool does. It basically becomes a miniature bottom die that's smaller and allows me to get these top, uh, you know, uh, half face hammer blows from the top die, basically. So I'm going to make a little tong blank with this guy here. Just a simple tong blank. 
Uh, but you can see how, you know, it's using using this tool to set all these shoulders and, and basically create a smaller bottom die to do all this. Uh, and this is just a real simple way to basically reduce the size of the bottom die. Uh, in this case, you know, for making this shape. Uh, but applicable in a lot of other ways as well. Next up, we're going to do a little uh, uh, forging a tenon sample, right? And so that's going to use a couple of different toolings um, that we have here. First of all, we're going to, um, we got a die clamp. So basically this is something that you can make. Um, and again, there's a number of ways to do this. Um, some people like to, I'll show you how, how I like to use this one, but you can kind of convert this to how it, how the best it works for you. Um, but basically what this does is it, you'll see this will drop on the bottom die and then uh, I'm going to turn this handle and that's going to basically pull whatever tooling I have against the die and kind of lock it into place. Some of that tooling might be things like a kiss block, which will basically drop in here like this and that prevents the top die from dropping below that point uh, unless you do really clean, precise forgings. Um, if I have a, um, if I have two dimensions that I want to work with, that's where I use a combination of uh, a kiss block and a kiss stick. Um, so I use the low dimension uh, locked in the die and the taller dimension on the stick. So that lets me stop the die at two different uh, dimensions if I'm trying to forge a particular type of rectangular bar or something like that. Um, the other thing that we're going to use um, is going to be a, um, a double butcher. Same idea. This is going to drop down on the, um, on the die surface here. Um, and then I'm going to clamp it in against the bottom die. And then just like previously when I showed butchering with a single butcher, this does the same thing, but it just is on a spring like this and lets me butcher um, from the top and the bottom at the same time, which is uh, just twice as convenient. <laughs> and uh, I make these in different sizes. So you can see how if I had to butcher a big piece of stock, it's going to flex that out of position. Um, and that's going to basically damage the tool. It's not going to stay parallel. Um, so what I do is I make them in a couple different sizes from about three quarters, maybe up to two inch round, depends on what kind of material I'm working with. Um, and then I just have those set for those dimensions. Um, it's a little bit of extra work in the beginning, I guess, uh, but it's pretty effective um, and it's real quick to change them out. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I really like these a lot. They're really convenient and easy to use. Um, and then the other tool that we're going to use, um, it would be one of these swages like this. So this is how our tenon is going to have a 5 8 round tenon coming out of one inch square bar. And so to make that 5 8 round, perfectly round, uh, I've got a tool like this, which is basically a uh, swaging die that uh, has um, 5 8 round negative space. So when I feed the stock in there, it's going to make it perfectly round at that di di dimension that I want. And again, I make these in a variety of dimensions. So 5 8 3 8 uh, half inch, um, and you can make them for whatever size uh, that you want. So let's uh, make a, let's make a tenon. So first step, I'm going to butcher. I'm going to butcher on all four sides, so as I run the butcher, I'm just going to be careful to kind of keep pressure down on that bottom on that bottom die right there so it doesn't jump around on me. But what I'm really doing with this is just scarring a line. I'm not butchering all the way to my 5 8 dimension. I'm just scarring a line and I'm going to take it down the rest of the way with the flat die. Yeah. 
the joys of the saddle clamp. Right? And I make all my tooling, generally, I try and use the same size uh, clips. That way, uh, everything kind of drops in and out of that system really, really quickly and easily. Um, so Kiss Block's got that nice little handle so I don't ever have to reach my hand into the danger zone. Um, definitely avoid, I never touch the die, ever. I never break that line. Uh, it's just a bad idea. That's when you lose fingers and things get, get crushed. But if I just never get in the habit of touching the die, that doesn't, that's not no longer an issue, so. So I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna feed the stock into the die to get the most out of my power hammer dies. A smaller uh, surface area interacting with the material is gonna make the uh, hammer hit harder and that get more power in that place. Um, and it's just gonna push the material faster, it's gonna stay hotter longer. Um, and I have a kiss block in place so that I don't uh, take the material down too far. It's kind of like a, just, it's a backup plan. So I, I know I'm not, I can't uh, run the dies below the size that I'm trying to achieve. When I hear it hit the kiss block, I stop, right? Otherwise, I'm gonna forge the kiss block down. It's only mild steel. I want it to last as long as I can. So I listen for that change in the difference between the die hitting hot metal and the die hitting cold metal. Um, down to 5 8 square, turn on the diamond, break the corners. Yeah, yeah. So, 5 8 octagonal for the most part. Now I'm ready to take it and put it into my 5 8 round swage. Totally. Yeah. Tenon in one heat is the most ridiculously <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. It's like, yeah. It's like when you beat the game and you get to go back and play it with all the, with all, with all the mods. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, that's how I feel right now. Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> Tenon. And so that process, I, 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 I start, uh, you know, let the swage, swage one side, turn 90 degrees, 90 degrees, you know, swage, swage, swage. Out. Yeah, just, just let, because the, the swage is kind of pushing that yeah. metal out to the side, so then swage the opposite of that, yeah. you know, that, that 90 degree relationship. Once I'm close, then I just put it all the way in and spin it and just make it smooth. I don't even know if it's doing anything when I spin it, but it just feels good to do it that way. You know? Really, to clean that up and make it function as a tenon, I need to set the shoulder tighter with a tenon set. Generally, when I make these, I have that little hole, either center punch, just something air. that some, that air, and it references where the back end of the tenon or the, the tooling is. So I don't want to bottom this out. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't want this to go all the way up against the end of it and upset. So I want to make sure that I'm, you know, I can, um, uh, that it's going to fit all the way in, but not not upset on the end of the yeah. end of the bar like that. It, it got cold, you know, so just gonna heat it up again.
Is that just because the assume the bias of swinging and stuff? Might yeah, be... exactly. That's why I rotate a lot. Is yeah, just. This is not my favorite way to do it. To be honest, I'm usually working a tenon like this at the end of a longer bar. And, stand and it up. Uh, no, just at the anvil. So I'll just, you know, if you picture this, say one inch bar, but it's, you know, it's, it it's three feet long. Well, I can basically hold onto the end of the bar, have it at the edge of my anvil, and I can knock the monkey tool into the, into the to set the, the shoulder but I can turn the bar as I'm doing it and keep everything really centered and, um, and use the weight of the bar and kind of back it up with my arm. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I find that's really fast, but you need the weight, a long bar with the weight to do that. Short pieces, yeah, we either put it in there or, you know, um, but Something. yeah. So this is, I mean, this is basically there. I can maybe do that once or twice more just to kind of um, seal the deal, but you know, pretty nice, clean transition, um, ideally centered and ready to apply to, yeah, whatever, furniture or, or handrails or architectural work, sculpture, you know. Sky's the limit with a tendon, guys. Sky's the limit. Next up, we're talking about uh, how to make these swages that I used when I made the tenon. Um, and so basically, again, mild steel blocks on a spring, mild steel uh, welded to an uh, angle iron clip that registers the tool in our um, die clamp mild steel. Um, and so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this bar here and I'm going to, under the power hammer, I'm going to thin out the middle a little bit. So it's a little bit, you know, it's thinner. It goes from round to rectangular and it gives it a little bit of more spring, lets, lets it open and close a little bit easier. Um, and then I'm going to bend this around a form, give it that kind of circular shape, and then take these two ends and they're going to drop into my die blanks um, and then I'm going to weld that up um, to, so the spring is fixed to the two blocks. Then I'm going to heat up the blocks and I'm going to take the size material that I want to make the impression of and with the bar cold um, and the blanks, the die blanks hot, I'm going to smash it in there under the power hammer and it's going to create this void in the in the material for the size bar that you wanna um, you want the swage to function with, um, and that's how I make a spring swage like this. And again, I should reiterate, this is a way to do it. There's other ways to do it that work great. Um, this is what works for me, um, and I've had a lot of success with this, so that's why I'm showing you it this way. Okay, so I've got some center punch marks here on the um, on the bar. Uh, one there and one there. And then basically what I'm gonna do is just thin out in between that. So I just start from the back and I feed the material. And I find my next one and I draw. So that's spread it out a little bit and it's kind of blended in. There's no sharp stop and uh, starting and stopping point for that. I'll just make it a little bit parallel in the middle. So you can see that it's, it's rectangular, you know, right there in the center, and it blends from round to flat, back to round. And again, there's no like hard shoulder at those marks. It's just a kind of a general, gradual. Get, yeah, gradual, gets you kind of close to where you want to be. So now what I'm gonna do is take this and I'm gonna bend it around a form to give it this kind of circular shape like on, the, um, like on this. And I'll do that again hot. I'm gonna bend this around this little form right here. You can use anything though. Totally, yeah. I have a piece of pipe that I clamp in my vise um, that's like you know the, the size that I want, but something about that size. You don't want it too big. You also don't want it too small. I'm gonna grab two pairs of tongs, I'm gonna get on each side of that thing, kind of eyeball the center, and then first thing I'm gonna do is just bend it, you know, and try and get the both ends to line up, basically. And usually that works. Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. And that, 
It's pretty good. I'm gonna take one more heat like that. This is called the double tong grip. I'm used to, but it's gonna work fine, you know. Uh, just be a little bit, a little bit wider than that. So now what I'm gonna do is weld this, weld my blocks onto this. I'll let that cool down for a second. Don't touch that. So I'm gonna drive this 5 8 bar uh, into the two uh, dies, uh, die halves, die blanks that I uh, have welded now to the um, to the spring. They're in the forge. They're hot, so the dies are hot. The bar is cold that's gonna imprint the bar on the dies. I'm gonna go a little bit, like kinda, I'm gonna, um, uh, sorry, this guy. I'm gonna um, put the bar in uh, and send it a little bit, then we're gonna flip it over and send it from the other side the rest of the way. That just kinda evens out um, uh, the, the, the imprint, if you will, from the inside because um, the hammer hits a little harder from the top and the bottom, so it just helps keep to keep things centered and even. So try and get it centered, nice and straight. You know, check that it's parallel, center of the die, and then. I don't need my old thing anymore. Go, center of the die. And a way to check it is. Take a look at it. Make sure everything's closed around the die. Looks good. I'm gonna turn it back on. You got a grip on it? Yeah. So now that's almost there, um, except that um, what I want to do next is I'm going to basically spot heat back here and open the dies up. And then I'm going to grind away kind of the edge of, of, the, of the valley, like the cliff of the valley. I'm going to grind that away so that it's very much relieved because as the material is getting swaged inside of there, it needs somewhere to go. So you want to think about the idea that the only the only thing on the die that's functioning is the very top and bottom. The sides of that don't really do anything. Uh, we want to get rid of that material so that material is someplace to expand. And then we turn it 90 degrees and hit it again and turn like we need that a little bit of room for the material to go somewhere as we approach that shape. So I'm gonna let that cool down, spot heat, open it, grind a little bit, spot heat it again, close it back, and then I'll weld the clip on. Automatically kind of sucks it down a little bit, which is kind of what you want. Uh, I'm just gonna take that little sharp edge off. It's probably less important with this. It t I think it's really important once you get into like closed eyes, like when I, that ball swage, I, I like really relieve that quite a bit because there's a lot of shifting of yeah, material back and forth. Do all this with like a half round or file if you totally if you yeah. have the patience. You, if you don't have a, a die grinder, I mean, uh, something like this you could definitely do with a grinder, a flap wheel, 
a file, whatever. You're just relieving that edge, you know. Um, and then now I'll bend it back, which I try and, you know, just spot heat the exact same spot again, bend it back straight. So I'm gonna get this hot again, and then I'm just gonna go over to the horn of the anvil. So, you know, it's a little, a little sprung open. I'm just gonna reheat it again real quick and close that up. Do you put the bar in there so that you can... I'm gonna try to close it in the vise and see if it'll just kind of square everything up again while it's hot. Wait, do you have to worry about, like, because I've seen some people's dies and it looks like they're not, like, aligned properly. Does it automatically, like, kind of fall back into alignment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I want, I want that to, you know, I want to line that up a little bit better, so. Yes, that, that's not good. I, I gotta, you know, that, that has to get fixed. It's off center like that, but, you know. It's hot, so you know, yeah, it'll work. And, and again, that was a little too big, so this looks a little funny compared to some of the other ones. But it's gonna, oh, it's gonna swage. It's gonna swage the material. I'll tell you what. You're saying the diameter on this is a little big. It's a little big, yeah. I, I, it's like a, it's like a three-inch pipe that I have, um, and I just welded a little uh, angle iron clip on it, so it goes to my vise, and it just gives me lots of access. And yeah, um, so. Um, other thing I will do sometimes is I will reheat this again, and just like the other tooling, I'll quench it in water. You could also definitely case harden that on the inside if you wanted to, um, and that would be a great way to kind of beef up your um, mild steel tooling. But again, I, you know, it's just a swage. It's not really doing that much. The, 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 you know, it's really just the finishing step for turning octagonal into round into like a clean round. So yeah. another way to use the die clamp. Um, and the flat dies um, is to, and another use of basically a spring swage concept um, are these. These are essentially closed dies, um, and inside of you know, stamped into these shapes are are um, voids uh, of a particular shape, and they'll basically let me make repetitive shapes um, on the on the end of the bar. So I've got one that's kind of a leaf blank, and this one which is a a ball form. And so I'll put one on each end and kind of show how these work. Um, really good way to make, well, repetitive shapes. The same thing every time, uh, multiples, uh, stuff I really like to use as much as possible because it just speeds up the productivity. Um, and they're relatively easy to use and simple to make. Okay, so uh, I'll start with the ball swage. Um, Like I guess I just didn't have yeah, yeah. point far enough in there, and that's nice because then that means you're really 
filling the whole floor. Yeah, it's just a thin little uh, flashing, basically. Um, that's, I mean, I just, I, I cannot believe how, this is, this is why I bought this. Right? <laughs> yeah. I've had it for a few weeks, and I haven't been able to do anything super cool with it. Okay, so um, we're gonna make us make one of these swages here, um, a ball swage. So it's basically gonna put this shape. I made this with this. Um, it puts a ball at the end of the bar on five eighths round. We're gonna make one that does the same thing. So I, I'm gonna use this to create the negative inside of the the, the die set. So uh, if you don't have one of these to make this, you're just gonna make that kind of any way you can. There's a you know you could. At your anvil, you could isolate mass at the end of the bar and forge a ball, you know, use a file, clean up the shape. You could use a, um, a, a lathe if you have it. It's a great way to make things like this. Uh, you can fabricate it. You could, you know, order a ball, a ball bearing or a, a ball off a, off a site that sells that kind of stuff and, you know, weld it to the end of, a, of a, a bar like this. Kind of whatever you can do to get something like that to just stamp in here. So then you can make multiples without going through all that effort. But there's no, you know, by any means necessary. Whatever you can do to get to something close to this, and it doesn't really have to be perfect because I'm going to turn it in the in the in the die as I make it. So if it's a little bit inconsistent, that kind of gets evened out as you turn the positive, uh, you know, to make the negative space. Um, I, like most things, if it's perfect. It's probably going to come out a little bit better, but like I said, you know, you can kind of, yeah, you, you can you can get pretty good results even if it is slightly off center or something like that. Um, but in this case, we're going to use this to make to you know create the die that's in the in the forge right now. So, all right. in there now and now that just like the other one I'm gonna I'm gonna let this cool off I'm gonna spot heat this open it up and then I'm gonna heavily relieve essentially like the cliff before the valley so that there's plenty of room for that material to spread out and get forged down to isolate and create the ball of the shape. So next next up Yeah, so pretty, you know, and again, like mostly what you're, um, you know, again, mostly what's doing the work is not the edges, yeah. but just this line up the center of it. That's really what's squishing the material. 
relieving it allows the material to spread out and go somewhere. And then you know you turn it 90 degrees, squish it down, turn it 90 degrees. But you need you need to, and it'll keep spreading less and less as it isolates. But those first couple hits, it's going to look real crazy in there. Yeah, you want to <laughs> avoid um, like angles. Right. Like, yeah. Create. Yeah. Yeah, and I kind of yeah, and I kind of you know that that little spot right there stays pretty sharp because that's doing a lot of work. That's okay, like really yeah. di digging in. Um, but yeah, you need room for all this to go, and we'll see how it goes. Everyone's always kind of unique. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Some of them work, you know, some of them work perfect, and it seems like it should do work like that every time. And sometimes just something gets weird, and you know, it's all handmade, and you just I don't know, something gets off, and it doesn't quite work as well as the one. You the exact same steps in the exact same order, and one works perfect and one is a little weird. I, mean, I don't know. It's just handmade stuff, you know? It's like, yeah. yeah. How I line them up, I took the um, dies, put them up, uh, uh, put the swage dies here, line them up on the power hammer so I know they're going to be nice and centered on the, on the middle of the bottom flat die. Um, got the same clips we've been using all day to mount stuff, um, and I just tilt them like that, and then I'll just tack them on there real quick with the welder. Um, That last one's not the best weld I've ever made, but you know what? It's gonna work. It's gonna. One of them is. It's gonna work fine. <laughs> one of the one of the welds I've done. Is the best weld. <laughs> right, right. You know. Oh yeah, size of the die is is a great yeah, and you know uh, if that was a drawing die and a little bit rounded, you could get a much more kind of um, you know just yeah. a different texture. Yeah. But honestly, the, there's beautiful great. lines in the middle. I think I love some of that like isolated mass in the middle yeah. now, and yeah. So it's just it, there's tons of stuff you can do with the flat dies. I mean, you can really yeah, just just get weird, man. You know, go all over the place. It's fun. So that is, uh, you know, basically scratching the surface of how we run um, the air hammer with uh, flat dies, some of the things we can do with it. Um, it really is just like, I mean, just a drop in the bucket of some of the stuff you can do with these machines. But hopefully, 
I don't know, hopefully you found it uh, helpful, maybe pointing you in a direction of how to start using one of these if you have it, or if you're thinking about getting a power hammer. Um, they're basically my favorite things in the world, and uh, I really think you should probably add one to your life. But uh, <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, I don't know. That was everything, man. We spent, so we've been out here about 12 hours on the dot, <laughs> and I have made a lot of tools that are going to make my, my life a lot easier and the knowledge of like how to do them is just super cool. So, yeah. Um, so if you want to follow Haley, which I highly suggest you do, where is it? Yeah. Instagram so or where do you, where do you want people to find you at? Well, my name is Haley Woodward. You can find me at HaleyWoodward.com, where you can see some stuff that I make. Um, it, I try and update it whenever I can and make something new, get some stuff on there. Uh, I'm on Instagram. You can look me up there too. Um, I'll put the links on the yeah, and then uh, you know, and again, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, my full-time job is I teach at Austin Community College in Austin, Texas, and we run a program where, I mean, this is what I do all day is teach people how to use these machines and blacksmith and make ornamental ironwork, and um, uh, we have a pretty cool program I think that we've put together there. So check out that website if you want as well, and um, yeah, hopefully, yeah, just people got something out of all this uh, today. Say, like, thanks for coming out. Questions in the comments below. So hopefully um, you guys found something useful in this video. I, I wanted to record this because I couldn't find this information out there. I spent a lot of money on a power hammer, and I couldn't find the content on how to do the things I want. I bought it to, to use it for. So if you have any questions, uh, put them in the comments, and uh, we'll try and answer them if we're able to. So thanks again. <laughs>
think I'm standing on a hollow spot on the floor right here. Oh, yeah? <laughs> um, so now we just let that cool off, and I'm going to cut in half. So. Okay.
made a few. <laughs> I made a few over the years. Ha <laughs> ha